our uh, can we have we're a quorum? So, now, I see. Yeah. Yep. So what at nine we're we're good to go. All right. All right. Why not? Well, just for the record, though, uh, let's let's see who we have for sure. I've got um, Dr. Smith. I've got Senator Erickson. I saw Monica before this thing changed. I saw John Wilson. Uh, who am I? Uh, Delise. Didn't I see Delise? Yep. Okay. That's who I've got to. And Lietta just joined. Lietta joined us. There's Deanne. All right. We're in good shape. Did I miss anybody? Any, um, any member? The only other member would be Terry Rice. I don't see her. All right. Okay, well, I'm in one of those views where I only see about six people at a time, so I apologize, everybody, if I seem to be overlooking you. <clears throat> All right, well, let's call a meeting to order. Uh, welcome on this uh, Friday, December 2nd, uh, the year 2022. Uh, won't be saying that many more times. So uh, thank you all for joining with us. We have uh, a number of our advisory groups and staff people with us. Uh, I'm sh sure there are, I'm showing 21 participants all together on my screen. So there are some people uh, uh, out there uh, looking in from around the state. We welcome you this morning. Uh, let's uh, move right forward into our uh, First item of business, which is the approval of the October 7th meeting minutes. Uh, do I hear a motion to approve those minutes? This is Delise, so moved. Delise moves. I second. Uh, Lietta seconded. Um, I, I, I will ask to be sure there weren't any corrections before I moved to vote on that mission. Had anybody seen anything that needed corrected? If not, uh, all in favor of approving the minutes, uh, we'll do this by uh, voice vote. Uh, so say aye, please. Aye. 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 Are there any members uh, opposed to approving the minutes? I think the record can reflect that there was unanimous approval of the minutes. So uh, moving right along, it looks like we're gonna be led into a discussion of uh, some um, recommendations coming from the Workforce Development Advisory Group. And I think Linda Logan of Casito is going to lead us uh, in that presentation. Linda, welcome. Good morning, Chairman Moore and board members. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to share this information with you today. Um, my name is Linda Logan, and I work with Kansas Child Care Training Opportunities, or otherwise known as CASIDO. Uh, I'm a program coordinator and the chair of the Workforce Development Advisory Group. Uh, my hope for you this morning is that I can provide you with enough information so that you can see the timeline of work provided by the Workforce Development Advisory Group and the subsequent subgroups, specifically the core competencies subgroup, which recently provided recommendations to the Kansas Children's Cabinet regarding the Kansas-Missouri core competencies. But first, uh, the purpose of the Workforce Development Advisory Group, uh, as provided in Casito's workforce contract with DCF states, uh, that we are to establish a workforce facilitation center to be guided by an advisory committee of early childhood collaborators and partners to coordinate a comprehensive and systematic approach to workforce development throughout Kansas. So uh, we have been very excited to do this work. Uh, our meeting started in April of 2019 and in January of 2020 was the initiation of our response to the strategic plan, specifically goal six, workforce, and uh, the strategy six 
5.2.2, which is to revise as appropriate and align core competencies and the development of credentials across all early childhood care and education positions, drawing from national evidence-based practices and standards, uh, and ensure they include knowledge and performance competencies that prepare professionals to support children at all levels of ability. So as we started these discussions, we determined that subgroups would be needed to further process and organize the specific responses uh, in the strategic plan. So we uh, created or developed or organized three groups, core competencies, equity, inclusion, and diversity, and then individualized professional development plans and an, a self-assessment. These three subgroups report monthly to the full workforce development advisory group. Sorry about that. And uh, to continue pro uh, reporting on the progress and next steps. Uh, it was important that collaboration and partnership with the workforce registry and the career pathway group was included for a seamless alignment uh, for these workforce systems. So now let's focus on the recommendations for the Kansas, Missouri core competencies. Uh, you'll see a, a photo of the current ones. Uh, I wanna share our research and then the factors for our recommendation. Let me just say as a long time, uh, actually a career long early childhood professional, um, myself and the core competency subgroup members were quite excited to take on this work. For years, uh, we have struggled with the format and even though they have been updated multiple times, they still felt left us feeling that there was something missing. Um, I will also admit that occasionally there was some eye rolling every time uh, we did approach this discussion. So the next slide you'll see uh, my colleagues and subgroup co-members um, and they represent the experience and the commitment to our journey. Uh, these members are familiar with and have used the Port Kansas Missouri core competencies in guiding professional training and course development, a training approval system, and as well as using it with early childhood students in two year and four year colleges. And the fact that we started meeting in 2020 and continued completely through that time uh, really speaks to the commitment of everyone. And uh, so I applaud their commit for, commitment to our work. Our first step taken was to review the competencies of the National Association for the Education of Young Children, standards and competencies and supporting documents. Our follow-up activity called for a crosswalk between the NACI standards and competencies and the Kansas, Missouri core competencies. Our work determined that the NACI standards were more user-friendly within three tiers or levels. Uh, and just for reference, the Kansas, Missouri core competencies have up to five levels. Um, and the NACI standards have been crosswalked with all the National Association standards and competencies listed on this slide. It provided us with a national standard to compare with other competencies and standards that we would review for later on. After that work, our group was made aware of many other states who also developed standards and competencies that aligned with NACI. After reviewing several states, we chose the following five states to review more closely to, to determine if there was more to consider. And as you'll see, those were Iowa, Texas, Pennsylvania, Minnesota, and Nebraska. 
during this time that we were reviewing these other state standards, we were also fortunate to be able to uh, meet several times with the Missouri Department of Early Childhood Workforce Review representatives. And they were also uh, looking at the NACI uh, standards as well for consideration. Although they did self-admit that uh, their main focus at this time was to uh, get a new registry started, but they did determine that moving forward, uh, ending the Kansas-Missouri core competencies uh, was agreeable. And so we then agreed that a joint statement from both states would need to be developed to announce the decision when we got to that point. <clears throat> so after we analyzed our, the feedback and reviews and multiple crosswalks, our converse and the uh, conversation with our Missouri partners, we decided to recommend the Kansas Missouri, Missouri core competencies no longer be used for the following reason. We found that the direct care staff in early childhood have not consistently accessed the Kansas Missouri core competencies uh, in due really to a lack of awareness. In the discussions during this time, direct care providers told us that many of them had not even heard or used uh, the Kansas Missouri core competencies. The Kansas Missouri core competencies, we have not found that they are user friendly because of the multiple levels and indicators, which we found uh, in course development and training approval that they conflict with each other and the leveling is quite confusing. Uh, and let me just say that was further highlighted after the review of other states' recent core competencies. Current Kansas professional development organizations that use the Kansas-Missouri core competencies for course development and approval, we found that we are ready for a seamless process for both professional development and direct care staff to further align with the career pathways and the other work that the groups are doing. And uh, finally, we discovered that there was more emphasis needed to embed awareness of equity, inclusion, and diversity. So with all of that said, um, our focus then turned to the Nebraska core competencies for early childhood professionals as the model for the Kansas core competencies. We met with representatives of the Nebraska Office of Early Childhood, Melody Hobson and Julie Miller, to, to discuss the next steps of our recommendation and partnership in using the Nebraska core competencies. In other words, we really asked them if we could steal their work and make it user-friendly for Kansas. And they were very agreeable. <laughs> they provided us with the necessary acknowledgements that we would need along with access to their open um, access course on their, cam on their Canvas system, uh, helping providers learn about the Nebraska core competencies and how to use them. They also have kept us in the loop. They're developing a level two core competencies online course for more experienced direct care staff and continuing to use the core competencies. The biggest piece of this, uh, of our decision, was that we felt that the Nebraska core competencies met our subgroup goals which were uh, the following, that we really wanted to build a connection between professional standards and actual practice in the field. We really wanted the direct, this to be focused on the direct care staff first. Um, and the Nebraska core competencies are based on Bloom's taxonomy and each level shows actionable competencies and a professional progression 
So an 18 year old starting out in her first job in providing care to young children can access these competencies all the way up to even someone like myself who's still continuing to learn but has a lot of experience and still wanting to learn new strategies and processes. Um, we also felt that this would be an important piece of recruitment and the retention for the workforce because it does, because of the progression of competencies. The core competencies are user friendly at all levels and, and to agencies providing professional development up to higher education with the two year and four year college students. It promotes quality childcare for Kansas children through ongoing professional guided development by the core competencies. And again, quality care for Kansas children is our primary focus and goal. Uh, the continued commitment to create a network of collaboration and alignment between the registries, career pathways, IPDP and equity and inclusion and diversity and professional trainer and trainer systems was also the key part in that, as I mentioned earlier, our desire to create a seamless system um, so that it would all connect very nicely and in a perfect world, meet up in the registry and uh, uh, get that system going. So in, in final, our recommendations are to use an adaptation for Kansas of the Nebraska core competencies for early childhood professionals for the Kansas early childhood competencies uh, that would be used by the Kansas early childhood workforce and then professional development organizations like Casito, Child Care Aware of Kansas, um, and then higher education. We are recommending a, a joint statement from Kansas and Missouri representatives announcing the end of the use of the Kansas Missouri for competency for partnership. Uh, the adaptation would be supervised or coordinated by the workforce development advisory group and the core competency subgroup. Um, it is our baby. <laughs> and um, Funding is requested to support the adaptation work and then with marketing uh, in creating an inviting format, an awareness campaign, distribution and training uh, and printing, and then most of all training to the workforce and then continued support in their use of the uh, new Kansas core competencies. So that is the information that I have for you this morning. Uh, I appreciate the time again to share this uh, with you uh, and um, welcome any questions, uh, any feedback. If you think of anything later, there's my contact information on the screen and um, thank you again. Thank you, Linda. Uh, let's see what, uh, there may be some questions. Why don't we go back, um, Lindsay, can you take us back to that recommendations page? That might be, if there are, if there are questions, they might, that might help people to have that in front of them. Um, are there questions? Hi, this is Monica Kim. Go ahead, Monica. So Linda, th thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I followed this path a long time, just uh, not as intensely as you have, but it makes total sense to me. Um, you've hit on the things that I've heard from the field. And um, I just want to thank you guys, because I know this uh, is a hard thing to pull off. So um, I'm supportive of your recommendations and, and, and send sincere thanks to all of the people on the committee. Thank you, Monica. Let me just say we learned how to keep a good sense of humor uh, along the path. <laughs> Anybody else? 
Linda, on the, on the questions about funding is requested to support the adaptation work and to support work with a marketing agency. Uh, who's making that request? And do we know uh, who the targets of that request are? Or can you help me with that? Kim, this is Melissa. I'll jump in to field this one. That is not part of what we are asking the cabinet to approve today. We will work first with our internal team to assess the, the existing sources of potential funding. We, um, we know we have um, preschool development grant funding that that probably is appropriate as that has funded and underwritten the development uh, to date of these competencies. We also know this would be allowable um, most likely under uh, the child care development block grant funding guidelines because it supports the workforce uh, for child care. So we will have those internal conversations The the ask of the cabinet today is not to address the funding side. The ask will be to um, adopt in our role as the Kansas Early Childhood Advisory Council. Um, this is the, the proposed recommendation that we are asking the cabinet to entertain. Okay, thank you. Um, Linda, I did, uh, out here in Hutchinson, it's not my primary concern, but uh, I, it sounds like the, the politics of the Kansas, Missouri uh, changes have been well handled. I don't doubt that at all. But I, I guess I would have suspected that originally one reason we were interested in that partnership was so that the workforce in the Kansas City metropolitan area was operating under similar uh, competency guidelines. Um, how, how do you see that working out now that the states are kind of splitting up on this? Well, I'm glad you asked that because that was something we were very intentional about. Uh, and I will also admit to being part of the original group that started on the Kansas-Missouri work. Um, Missouri has stated that they intend to uh, align with the NAYC standards uh, and they will be adding two addendums that will they felt would further uh, meet their state needs. Um, and so we feel that with uh, the Nebraska core competencies that have been aligned with NAYC, uh, NAEYC yeah. standards, uh, we would still be providing a cohesive uh, document for you know providers, whether in Kansas, Missouri, Kansas City, Missouri, or Kansas City, Kansas, or as you mentioned, anywhere in the metro area. Okay. And one final, uh, for me at least, um, what is Bloom's taxonomy? So, I, could, I could have done a quick search and answered it, but I'm just going to ask you. So uh, I, I'm going to give you a quick answer. Uh, it is a leveling of kind of like what I mentioned, where you start out at the beginning. Of, it shows where you start out as a beginning learner and the skills that you need, uh, much like with children. Uh, looking at the skills that are needed at a very elementary level, and then building as the learning continues, the skills develop. Uh, so it's a progression. Okay. All righty. Any, any other questions or comments for Linda? This is John Wilson. Uh, I just wanted to layer on my appreciation to Linda and the whole work group for what you put into this. I'm a huge believer in uh, well-crafted core competencies and the frameworks and, uh, and, and, and looking forward to how this is going to support the profession and, and, and by extension, help young children. So kudos to you. And um, as you all do the review of funding and what's needed to operationalize this, you know, certainly let me and my colleagues at KAC know if there needs to be work done to talk with the legislature about it. Uh, but in the meantime, it sounds like you all have um, some some potential opportunities with existing funding streams. Thank you so much. You bet. Thanks, John. Anything else from cabinet members? Well, I think we're probably ready for a motion on this to adopt. And we understand that uh, 
the the funding uh, bullets are really not being uh, acted on today that those are going to be implemented and i assume if there's issues about that related to the cabinet they'll come back to us uh so <clears throat> do i hear a motion to adopt this is monica so moved monica moves second this is delise i'll second it thank you delise further discussion or questions all right, I'm gonna call roll. If there aren't anything else, let me give you one final chance. All right, uh, Senator Erickson. Yes. Lietta. Yes. Deanne. Yes. Delise. Yes. Monica. Yes. Terry. I don't believe she's here. All right. Uh, Dr. Smith. Yes. John. Yes. And I'll vote yes as well. So our motion carries and uh, you've received thanks from several members, people who uh, obviously have followed this work closely, uh, Linda. And so we do want to please share our appreciation with your entire uh, advisory group. And it sounds like uh, you've accepted uh, continuing roles to, to get this uh, implemented and uh, to watch it as it moves into implementation. So we appreciate that as well. So. Thanks a lot, and we've we've adopted that piece of work. Thank you so much. I uh, shout out also to Hannah and Melissa for their support and and ongoing teamwork with us. And I I am trying to contain my excitement. If I had to study, I would be throwing it up in the air. I feel like this is a huge step for our workforce and the Kansas children. So. Thank you so much to, to everyone, really. This is okay. wonderful. Thank you. All right. Well, let's, um, let's move on from that uh, exciting development. And uh, we're going to see the uh, Children's Cabinet Annual Report. I was trying to bring it up on my iPad. Are, 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 are we going to be seeing the pages uh, as... Um, Jessica discusses them, or do we really need to have it brought up on a on a secondary iPad while we're doing this? Um, that's up to cabinet members. We have a series of slides, but they are not. We're not walking through the actual pages of the okay. report. We will be posting the the draft report online, um, it, and understand that part of this discussion this morning um, will be to take input from the cabinet that may lead to, you know, could potentially lead to changes uh -huh. that need to be um, adopted into the report. So it will get a final version of it locked down after this meeting and um, ultimately post the final report. This is also the report that, that we will convey to the governor and then it is the report we rely on throughout the legislative process um, to, to showcase the work that the cabinet engages in. So it, it's a really important document. I am excited to um, share it with, with all of you and, and um, publish it for, the, the, for use by the general public. I, I wanna first stop and echo um, the sentiments that Linda just expressed. I, like, I, I am overjoyed and, and appreciative that we have, have brought this particular project to this point where we, we have actual core competencies to, to implement and help support our workforce. It is an essential part of the, the pipeline that we are building to, to help recruit new people into the workforce, retain um, the, the existing world of, of child care professionals, let them know they're valued and appreciated and help support them in their profession. So this was a major milestone today, a huge component of our strategic plan and a really, really important part of the overall um, approach to the early childhood care and education mixed delivery system. So I want to thank the cabinet for your support and the workforce development advisory group members for three years plus of really intentional effort um, on that 
score. So with that said, I am going to turn it over. I welcome Jessica Sprague-Jones from the KU Center for Public Partnerships and Research. Uh, she is ready to walk you through the report that we've prepared for you today. Yes, good morning. I'm Jessica Sprague-Jones. I work at CPPR at the University of Kansas, and it is um, my truly distinct pleasure of being part of the team that prepares this report on behalf of the Children's Cabinet. Uh, if we can just jump in. Uh, so the aim of this report is to capture the full scope of the Children's Cabinet work for the calendar year of 2022. Uh, this particular year, thematically, we were really interested in focusing on uh, the myriad of solutions uh, being pursued in Kansas and sometimes nationally uh, to uh, expand access to early childhood services. Uh, particularly, we were uh, we were looking at solutions responsive to these five central tenets: importance of early childhood, workforce elevation, community focus, statewide alignment, and support for business. Uh, and solutions about uh, around these five central tenets are threaded throughout the document. The first section is called our progress. And it starts with updates uh, to the All In for Kansas Kids strategic plan work. Uh, this year, we organized that um, those work that uh, updates around that work around three of those central tenants. Uh, the first being elevation of the early childhood care and education workforce, both through recruitment and retention and professional development. Uh, the, the second tenant that we organized the strategic plan updates around was community focus. Uh, so there are descriptions of Kansas communities in action, child care, the child care accelerator. Uh, and uh, first, and for the first time this year, we include some detail about the PDG quality subgrants and uh, some of the work that's being happened that's happening at the community level uh, through those grants. And then finally, the strategic plan is uh, obviously uh, very focused on the issues of statewide systems alignment. Uh, so there's a great, big, great deal of detail around uh, those efforts, uh, which have been continuing over the last few years. Uh, so this year, uh, there's information about the Kansas Early Childhood Governance Summit, uh, the Governor's Council of Education, uh, the fingerprinting work, Kansas Early Childhood Data Trust, uh, the Home Visiting Leadership Team Initiatives, and changes to staff. Uh, also in this section of the document, we include program profiles for every grantee funded through the cabinet's uh, main funding streams, so the Children's Initiatives Fund, the Early Childhood Block Grant, and the Community-Based Child Abuse Prevention Programs. Uh, so for these grantees, you'll find details about service delivery, population served, uh, funding amounts um, in this section. Uh, and this gives you just kind of in terms of scale and proportion, a sense of uh, those funding streams. So this is funding by agency and program. So you see the bulk of this is uh, the funding through uh, the various agencies from CIF. The biggest uh, program funded, of course, by the CIF is the Early Childhood Block Grant. And then at the bottom, you'll also see the community-based child abuse prevention uh, programs, which uh, are federally funded and for which the Children's Cabinet is the state lead agency. Oh, I should also note, Lindsay, you were probably holding on because you knew that I wanted to say that <laughs> one of the important things to note here is that this is funding for FY22. So you'll see a uh, separate program asterisk here uh, because uh, uh, per the Children's Cabinet recommendations, it's their final year as a CIF funded program or for Start Young, the final year as a standalone line item because this has been streamlined into the early childhood block grant. Yeah, I'm ready. Uh, also in this section, you'll see initiative spotlights for uh, some of the newer work that we wanted to uh, showcase. Uh, so this year that included the Kansas Futures Forum, uh, the expansion of the Dolly Parton Imagination Library, 
uh, Sunflower Summer, Thriving Family Safer Children Accountability Cohort, and Prevention Projects of the Kansas Future Fellows. The second section of the document is entitled Data for Impact. And this is the section where we showcase uh, the huge amount of research and evaluation supported by the Children's Cabinet. Now, this particular table is an overview of all of these different projects. Um, and, but really, the intention of the table is to convey that these are distinct, uh, mutually supportive initiatives, uh, working at really different um, units of analysis, really different levels to provide a, a pretty complete understanding of the early childhood landscape in Kansas. So at the base level, you have your evaluations of ECBG and CBCAP, both of which are multi-site program evaluations kind of your classic program evaluation where you understand um, services delivered and what the outcomes were for families. Uh, I should say large, exceptionally high quality, exceptionally innovative, but kind of that classic style of evaluation. Next level is the accountability process, which is really understanding the use of the CIF. And so looking at a multi-program evaluation at the state level. I'd like to talk about our tomorrows and Kansas Early Childhood Data Trust uh, as, as being two really different projects, but having an element that is really in common to both of them is that they're both statewide projects and as distinct from these other projects, uh, they are not looking at uh, evaluation from the perspective of a program or a funding stream, but are truly trying to understand it uh, from the perspective of the experiences of families. So Our Tomorrows is narrative, story-based collection, so you understand something about how Kansas families are experiencing their daily lives, how they're coding those own experiences. Uh, on the other hand, the Kansas Early Childhood Data Trust is using uh, it is our opportunity to link different data sources in order to understand the lived experience of families quantitatively because families right do not just experience one program do not experience one funding stream they move across these services uh, throughout the life course and that's our opportunity to understand that quantitatively The accountability process section, you see here some selected results from the accountability process. My colleague Owen Cox presented on the accountability process to you earlier this year. Uh, in this section, you'll find some details about the accountability process as well as about uh, the program's uh, evaluation practices. Here you see uh, some highlights of results uh, for the Kansas Early Childhood Development Services. We see 99% of kids with individualized service plans demonstrated improved positive social emotional skills or had skills comparable to their same age peers. For the child care assistant, we find families uh, who received child care sub of the families that received child care subsidies, 68% saw their household income increase over the course of a year. For Kids Network, over 96% of parents uh, who had participated in a Kids Network event uh, indicated an invitation, intention to follow the three, one of three safe sleep practices. And for Family Prez, participating families saw 96% of kids able to remain in the home, and 99% of those families did not experience substantiated abuse or neglect during services. The Early Childhood Block Grant evaluation was presented, uh, the details of, the, of that evaluation were presented to you by Lynn Trefferman earlier this year. Uh, in this document, we provide some details about that evaluation, including um, details about the common measures themselves. Uh, and then we also include some selected results um, in, in, in much less detail than, than Dr. Shepherdman presented to you earlier. Uh, but 
for some highlights are that uh, children um, between time one and time two were uh, there was a higher proportion of children who were on track in social emotional well being, uh, language comprehension, and in numeracy. And uh, there was also an increase in parents displaying positive parenting interactions from time one to time two. And um, classroom, the, uh, the percentage of classrooms achieving high quality increased over the course of the school year. Uh, the community-based child abuse prevention program, there's, there's a, uh, is, um, uh, the the evaluation section for this document is um, a little bit different this year. So um, the CVCAP programs have long collected the protective factor survey, uh, second edition now, uh, at, as an evaluation tool for understanding the impact of those services, uh, the results of which you see uh, on, on the left hand here. So you see a majority of families showing high levels of social support family functioning and resilience, and um, good caregiver practitioner relationships. So families report ha uh, having a really strong relationship with the service provider. This year, a lot of that write-up is devoted to um, the project they did this year and um, around ripple effects mapping, which is a participatory evaluation technique in which evaluators work alongside, in this case, the CBCAP providers uh, through uh, a multi-phase uh, method of inquiry to understand the impact of services from a qualitative perspective, but also um, the underlying mechanism by which uh, those services are able to get uh, that impact. And so that's, uh, a, you can see a lot of the details about that work in the report. But these highlighting, these pieces we've highlighted here are that CBCAP providers fill social support gaps for the family they serve, use relationships to help families function better, and are also working at a systems level to prevent maltreatment at a community-wide level. The Our Tomorrow's section uh, it is particularly focused on um, the work uh, that the Our Tomorrow's team did in collaboration with the Family Strong Steering Committee. Uh, they did two sense-making sessions uh, with the in, in the interest of, uh, with the goal of normalizing, asking for, and receiving help, and doing it in a way that, tr that reflected authentic lived family experiences. So our description of the Hour Tomorrow's uh, work revolves a lot around um, what that group found. Um, overall, this is a project that captures stories from Kansas to Kansans to better understand the context of personal experiences and identify patterns that can inform program and policy design. So this write-up is really about articulating how Our Tomorrow's was able to do that with this particular initiative. And finally, uh, there are details about the Kansas Early Childhood Data Trust, um, both the, the data trust as a whole and um, the work of the now two authorized projects under that trust. So the first authorized project is ECBG and the Prevention of Foster Care Removals. This is a project that linked ECBG and CBCAP data with data from DCF to understand how participating in early childhood services had an impact on uh, avoidance of foster care. Last year, uh, uh, my colleague, Dr. Terry Garska presented on the details of that initial work that, where we found that in fact, prevent, um, participating in these services was associated with a significantly reduced uh, likelihood of uh, of a, a, a family experiencing a removal into foster care. This year, that research team built on those initial findings uh, to try to understand uh, what services were the most preventative of uh, foster care removals. And the finding was that parent-centered centered services, which were home visiting, case management, and parent education, 
uh, were associated with a 35% uh, decrease in the they were parents enrolled in parent-centered services were, were 35% less likely to experience a removal after receiving services. Uh, the next authorized project is um, a distinct count of children in early care and education services. So this is linking across, I believe, four agencies to understand uh, something of that constellation, right, of services that I was talking earlier. So, so really, you know, I mean, so often with these really big uh, evaluation projects, uh, deduplicated counts are kind of the holy grail. And this is really what this project is about, is understanding how these children are being served in different constellations of services, which is, could just be an enormous tre treasure trove to understand how these services work together for kids. Uh, our final section of the document uh, is entitled this year, Our Children's Future. Uh, this final section has become kind of the special section of the document where we look at some issues that are particularly uh, relevant to this year. And so in keeping with our theme around focusing on solutions this year, uh, we uh, this final section features the ways that the Kansas Children's Cabinet is working to prioritize early childhood investments. Uh, next slide, please. So the first piece of that is around the work that the Kansas Children's Cabinet has done to partner with the Kansas Department of Commerce to support increased access to childcare as a mechanism for economic growth. Uh, so that uh, aligns with the all in goal for private sector collaboration uh, and you'll find details there about what that has looked like, um, but has included community conversations, providing data and research on childcare access, and consulting on business development and expansion projects. There's also a section that is looking at uh, what uh, other states and locations are doing around these issues. Uh, so this is just really, um, a time of, I would say, enormous growth and creativity and how uh, in the different local solutions that uh, people are finding to expand early childhood access, in part out of, um, of, of a new level of recognition of the importance of uh, these kinds of services. So in putting this section together, we were uh, really trying to um, not do something exhaustive because truly the entire report, report could have been devoted to this, but to try to find um, really distinct different ways that uh, different locations were addressing these issues uh, to try to show some of that, um, that breadth of problem solving that's occurring right now. Uh, and finally, this, well, not finally, but the section includes an excerpt of a brief released earlier this year that was, uh, that articulates the critical importance of early childhood for literacy outcomes in grade school and beyond, um, because this is really uh, what we see from the research, that this is really the foundational time in which brains are developed uh, in a way that, um, that has uh, documented effects for literacy in grade school and high school um, throughout the life course. Uh, there also has been quite a bit of research to demonstrate the um, ROI of that investment in early childhood education. So we include some of that um, research as well, both uh, nationally and in Kansas focused. And the document, uh, concludes with uh, summaries of the recommendations that the Children's Cabinet has made over the course of the year around uh, the CIF budget, home visiting, Dolly Parton's Imagination Library, and early literacy. I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has. Jessica, that that uh, is almost masterful. Um, that's great. Uh, I mean, there that report is um, dawning, and it it so so many things were involved in, and um, you know you 
you obviously have a good handle on all of it. So thank you for getting us through it. Uh, let's open up for some questions, um, discussion at this point about the report. Uh, Kim, this is Monica. Yes. Jessica, I'm sorry. I, I know I should know this, and you probably said it, on the data trust work, mm -hmm. who, who is actually doing that or what agencies? Well, so the authorized, I can find the agencies um, that are involved in the second one. Jessica, I can field this one if, if that's easier. Um, so Monica, the, the early childhood data trust was the in the first year of our, our, our 2020 work involved putting together the framework for the data trust. So we have a legal agreement that exists between the Children's Cabinet, DCF, KDHE, and Department of Education that then last year we added Department of Corrections at, at their request, we were delighted to invite um, them to join the data trust. So it creates a, an overall legal framework that outlines um, the, the general provisions around uh, data sharing among the agencies. It, it outlines ethical uses and it organizes us into a, a we have a, a data governance board, um, which is best practice. So um, directors from each of the agencies involved meet quarterly to uh, just update on any projects that get agreed to and, um, in terms of progress and entertain um, decisions around um, any potential new projects. So the, the for each, project that we embark on, that project will have a, its own data sharing agreement that is drafted so that for the specifics of the data that needs to be exchanged to, to, do, to conduct the study, there are parameters put in place that are in compliance with federal and state law. Um, and it, it, the, so the, the data trust agreement outlines um, how data will be managed and it, all of that. So we have not created a new database. This is a case by case determination gets made in the, in the data governance board meeting um, about projects, like if, if yeah. we have a project that we want to embark on. So the, the project that Jessica included um, that analyzed the data between families receiving early childhood block grant funded ser services and those families that are involved with DCF um, and the child welfare system, that was the first authorized project. And it had we have a data sharing agreement between DCF and the cabinet. For the unduplicated count, which is our second authorized project, we are in the discovery phase. We are just getting started with the work to determine what data can and should be shared and what parameters need to be put in place about the sharing of that data. Generally speaking, um, the, you know, all, well, all best, all standards and practices around safeguarding the security and privacy of data are, are followed, HIPAA, FERPA, the state student data privacy act all of that is is at the forefront of both the the underlying data trust legal agreement and then individual data sharing agreements so agency legal teams have to review everything before we can get started so it's a nice way of bringing us together the cabinet serves as the trustee so we convene um the 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 quarterly meetings and um the KU CPPR is the the data trustee because of their work with with um, our our data management system. Okay. So they were thanks for connecting line. the dots. Yeah. Thank you. Let me. I, I first of all, it's a very attractive document. It is absolutely complete. It surely fulfills our statutory duty. My only question is. Should there be, is there, I guess, a four to six page 
summary of this, because my concern is, are there, are there some important audiences that simply are not going to go through 85 pages of material? Excellent question, Kim. I would agree with you. Um, over the course of the last two years, when this format has been adopted, um, we have tended, it, it, it can be used two ways. I, we, anticipating um, the, the use of, of excerpts from this for um, support of the legislative process. Yes, I think an executive summary style document is in order and, and definitely doable. Um, we also just sometimes pull from a specific section. Maybe there's there's a, a chart that exists in it. So so it's it's used two different ways. But but you're right. Um, and I think in the past we have have created executive summaries. So that absolutely by January will be done. All right, that, that makes me happy. And I because I was kind of interested in what Senator Erickson or Monica or John or some of the people who deal with the legislature thought, but. Uh, my rec my far distant rec recollections of a father who was a legislator 50 years ago would have uh, said he probably wouldn't have read all this and i just thought uh, i think it's important for the legislature to have some of the highlights to have a real sense of what we're doing um, in some easy format so um, that sounds great thanks a lot are there other further questions or comments Hey, Kim, this is uh, Senator Erickson. Yes. And I want to commend the people who put this report together. I think it's very well done, digestible, uh, very well organized. So I think the report is excellent. I do, um, as a senator, have some issues with some of the legislative recommendations. And I know that Director Ricker was in our special education funding meeting, but specifically number two, on page 81 about meeting the statutory requirement to fund 92 percent of special education funding um, as was raised in that interim committee there are a lot of questions around that um, i don't think it's as clear cut as what uh, some people are making it to be and i won't go into detail i would hate to see us get caught up in um, a political debate that may or may not reflect the accuracy of that statement. And uh, so there's, there's some things in there that um, I appreciate the report. I know I'm going to be in the minority, but I do have some concerns over the political positions on uh, some of the recommendations. Thank you. Is, is, it, is it all possible that we could have that page brought up, Lindley? I it, for, well, for some crazy reason I can't get to that that draft report on my emails today. I can work on that. Give me a moment, please. While Lindsay's working on that, let me just say those are not actually the cabinet recommendations for the the the, the, in, the what those are are suggested actions. They were already published as part of the early childhood and literacy issue brief that the cabinet received in June, but those are not, that is not, that doesn't reflect the formal position of the children's cabinet. So Senator Erickson, um, I am well aware there is discussion within the, the legislative body and, and over the session ahead, you all will be addressing it. Um, I, I would say, um, I, I hear you and I, I've noted that sentiment, but it is not actually a formal recommendation that the cabinet is making at this time. Thank you. I do appreciate that, that uh, clarification. That helps. Thank you. Great. Okay. I, I just didn't know if there might be other issues here. So thank you, Lindsay, for getting that up. Um, Are there other things here on the recommendations page? Maybe there aren't, and I unnecessarily bothered Lindsay getting this up for us. But I, I wasn't clear, Senator, if you were saying the 92% is sort of, I mean, if meeting the statutory requirements to fund, and we just left out the 92%, 
would be accurate or something. I, I wasn't clear, so. Anyway. Well, Kim, Kim, what I can tell you is there are, in a nutshell, there are conflicting statutes. And I'll give you just one little quick example. The legislature has to fund 30% of special ed transportation. The district does 70%. But when calculating excess costs, the districts are putting in 100%, even though the states paid 30%. So there's, there's, just, there's just a lot of, of, of going through the details so that I, I just want us to be sure that we're not getting caught up in a political argument that reflects on the case. Well, I, and I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't want to put something in there that is just blatantly inaccurate. So that's what I was. I mean, if there's a dispute about it, that's one thing. Uh, but you know, if the ninety-two percent was somehow wrong, I wanted to. I, I didn't. I thought we ought to think about that. So, okay, thank you guys. What else? Anything else on the report? Kim, this is John Wilson. I was just thinking about our earlier comments about executive summaries for busy individuals, and I was just curious, Melissa, if you could um, uh, share how we, dis do we do a targeted distribution of this full report to like appropriations committee members, or is it brought up on the day that the CIF is discussed in, in, in committee? Uh, John, I, I, it's, um, I don't, I don't know that we have printed and distributed 165 copies of the printed report, but we do make every effort to make it available. And I will, yeah, committee by committee, make it available if people prefer the hard copy. We do print some. So it will be linked on our website and available in its entirety to anyone who wishes to access it, and we do draw attention to that. So okay. um, we, we kind of try to um, do the best of both worlds. Yeah, that makes sense. I was going to say, for, from a cost savings perspective, I think yeah, the, the more limited universe of appropriations committees or yeah. special days when, when this, uh, these issues are discussed might be sufficient. Well, and more and more people I find say, no, I don't need the hard copy. I'll, I'll just look at it online. So I will often pull the, the link that takes you directly to the report and, and share that via an email so that people don't have to click through, you know, the steps to get to it necessarily. But, but we do like to make sure we have hard copies for anyone who prefers. I, I personally like to have the, the pages to, to open and turn. So um, we, we, we are happy to make hard copies available to anyone who wishes. Right. Um, Kim, Monica, again, um, I just like to, I think this is a, a, a big deal. I'm just knowing how hard data is to look at and compare and contrast and, you know, all the details of, of data on page 67, um, the, you know, the headline says parents enrolled in parent centered services were 35% less likely to experience a removal after receiving services. And listing the home visiting and case management and parent education bullets. I, and I think it's super important for us to note that 37% most common reasons for removal were, were substance abuse issues. When we look at the interconnectedness of all of this, and as the legislative session starts and we like to silo things and make them seem real simple, this kind of data is what everybody should be looking at and drawing attention to. This is a big deal. And the fact that people have figured out how to look at this data is fantastic. And thank you to the people who provide the services on that left-hand side for doing it and keeping kids in their house. That's my soapbox for today, Kim Moore. Well, well Monica, I agree with you. I guess, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I, I will lean on our executive director's wisdom here, but I, to, to some degree, I, I sort of like the idea of some kind of an executive summary with some of these key points going to every legislator saying the full report can be linked. Um, I, kind of could... like, I kind of like that yep. uh, because for one thing, I'll bet there's a lot of legislators that don't even know 
there is a children's cabinet or what it does. And, and that's not a reflection on anybody here. I mean, it's just the, you know, it's not their committee or whatever. And yet I think some of the basic messages about prevention works, uh, where we are getting adequate services funded, we're seeing real differences. We are working to get the workplace childcare system uh, in better shape than it is. We're do, you're doing great coordination, so we're ending duplication in state agencies. I just think there's a lot of messages here that um, um, I don't think hurt to have as background. Is that, Monica, I don't know if I'm, I'm on the same yeah, I, Not just for the legislative session. I'm just saying, as we finish up this discussion, let's not let this little nugget of, of hope and goodness go by, especially for the data geeks in the world, um, because that page 67, that that's something big, friends. This is some meaningful work. All right. I, I'm just big on what we're learning being shared and, and not just what we believe, but what we're learning. And uh, I, I just, I think there's a lot here that's solid. So, okay. Further discussion about an excellent report. All right. Uh, is there, uh, we, we need to adopt this. Look, Kim, can I just, before we get there, I want to, yeah. I want to make sure that we, that we, we are clear I, because our team is going to be working this afternoon to um, incorporate any, any changes that need to be made. So the first question is, is were there any edits that that you know did did anyone catch a typo that that we didn't catch in our proofreading or or bios that aren't what people want them to be or or anything along those lines that need to be edited out or adjusted um melissa i don't have any edits i could do another um quick read but i know times of the essence and the team we, does a great job yeah. but um, I, I i wanted to say as uh, to put on my designer hat i love the way that the the this is laid out i think the headings and the kind of icons and the kind of information architecture really helps digest what could otherwise be a very uh heavy set of content you know no yeah. thank you for acknowledging that the the team that does this is um just the, I, I can't sing their praises loud enough. So um, yes, Shayla, uh, London, and um, Kara from KUCPPR are, are the, the co-creators of, of the design work. And they, they sit in on a lot of the meetings and work that goes on so that they can follow along over the course of the year and, and digest goals and, and intentions and then translate it into the graphic design. And there yeah. is an art to that. Can, if I could add one more comment to that, um, to acknowledge the, the kind of bo both sides of things, the incredible work being done in community by grantees and by yep. providers all over the state is important. And, and the fact that we can have an investment of time and energy to beautifully package that I think is really powerful because if we had great work happening and Arial size 12 in a hundred page report, <laughs> like um, what that would be really deflating and lots would get lost, including the statistics that Monica highlighted that, that in and of itself could just be an infographic right there. So yeah, yeah. And I, I, to everybody listening, the, the, a beautiful report is, it, it is, is necessary to highlight the beautiful work happening in community. Well said, John. Well said. This is Lietta. Kim, can I interject as well sure. and give my kudos to the team who put this together? It's visually stimulating, which in our soundbite society is often necessary to grab attention to the important meat and potatoes contained within. And um, just kudos to everybody involved. And Jessica, great job on the presentation. Just just sit and soak it up when you're sharing it. It's so critical, the work that we do. Um, I personally love a hard copy. And I think with the new, for the new members of the legislature, 
it's worth the investment of printing it so they can have it to just grab and go back to. A lot of times it's hard to find the digital links and know exactly where to go. Um, I personally, Melissa, would love a hard copy to have okay. um, for myself and even one or two to share here locally. I'm thinking of a couple of new legislators uh, here in Olathe that, that I'd love to take to coffee and be able to flip and point to to um, highlight specifically what Monica highlighted uh, for the foster care. I mean, that that's mind blowing. And, um, and the SPED number, um, I know that Senator um, Erickson um, took issue with the 92% um, statutory requirement. And maybe we could talk about maybe equalizing what the current investment is so that some districts don't get way over 92% and some way below, uh, or we can maybe work on the wording of that, but the way it's done now is very um, um, ine inequitable, let's just say that, and inadequate. Um, as a school board member in Olathe, I can tell you the SPED funding is broken. So whatever we can do to rectify that situation, I think that we as a cabinet could um, agree that that would be what's in the best interest for Kansas kids. So I would support however we word that to uh, reflect what's best for kids as a cabinet is what we would um, support, I would think. So I, I love this. It's a great document. Well done, as always, and, and just want to say thank you. I really appreciate it. So Listening to conversation from the board around the special ed funding, I, I think what's important is th that special education services are fully funded so that we also have room to support. I mean, there's developmental need to, to make sure kids are getting the interventions they need. It also helps from a practical standpoint, I think, you know, to, for districts to be able to direct operating funds to early education would be a goal that I think we could all agree on um, is worthwhile. I, if the 92% number in, in, in its specificity, and that is currently the statute, but with respect to how quickly the, the politics of this have evolved since June when we adopted that report, we, would it be agreeable to this, this board if we adopted language in that and we would go back and change the issue brief to say, um, instead of specifically that hitting on the 92%, we, we use language of fully funding special education. And I know, Senator, there still is going to be discussion about what the meaning of full funding means, but, but I do think it's important for this cabinet to have a position um, where that is um, part of, of of what, I mean, this is not, again, this is not on the list of formal cabinet recommendations. These are suggested actions that would help promote childhood literacy. Um, and we are very clear that it is in order to, to better support early childhood initiatives. So I, I, I just wanna make sure we exit this meeting in agreement with what um, is being published by the cabinet. So I would open that question up for, for some discussion. Okay. Thank you, Melissa, because I I, I, my concern is I don't want to have some percentage in there that is maybe right, maybe right, maybe wrong. So I like the idea. 92% is what the law says. 92% is what is in statute currently. Okay. It is 92% of the excess costs, costs that are not otherwise covered. So we could have a... a I, I would like us not to engage in that discussion at this time. Um, I think that's what I'm getting at okay. is if, if, you know, but there are, there are differences of opinion. I, I would like us to be able to support the need for special education funding that meets the needs of all Kansas children. Um, 
So I, I, I will stand firm that this, this action should remain on the list, but if the 92%, um, I, like, I, I just would like to uh, make sure we exit with a consensus here, a, a majority opinion of what that particular point ought to say. Melissa, it's Lietta. I, I, I'm fine with the wording of this because okay. I, I do believe the statute says uh, fund at 92%. It does. I just, I, I think I interpreted your comment and began to feel like we are, uh, as a cabinet, I, I don't know that we need a vote, but I, I guess I would, I would just like to see if there is a majority that feel the need to change that in any way. What? Uh, this is uh, Cinder Erickson again. What I would like to say is I, I think we're all in agreement that we want the needs of our students, all students fully funded. I don't yep. think that's that's the issue at all. My right. my concern is that there is a lot of unknowns. There's conflicting statutes. There is a lot that's going into that discussion. I think we'll know a lot more at the end of this upcoming legislative session. And I just hate to see us, you know, make a, a firm stance on something where there are so many unknowns. I think it's great to say we, we support fully funding special education students. We fully support funding all student needs. There, I don't think that's the issue. It's that there's just a lot of uncertainty um, around the particular statute and the fact that the federal government is not funding their requirement. There's just a lot there to digest. And I just want to make sure that we're on solid ground with our um, what we're putting out to the legislature so that we're not doing more harm than good. That, that's my concern. So, I, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm wanting to make sure that that I, I understand the will of the board on this point because I, I, I do hear what you're saying, Senator. Um, so I. This is the least and, and admittedly, I don't have a real good uh, eye as far as like the legislative process and recommendations. But what I would say from just a, a language um, view is that it makes more sense to me to put in something that's already in statutory language rather than to try to put something more ambiguous like fully funding in there because I could argue fully funding with you all day about what really yeah. is fully funded for special or education in general. So I feel like it's better to have it match up with the wording of the statute. Well, that is the current statute. And, you know, in, in the future, the, the potential exists, the legislature could address changes to it. But at this time, and, and at the time the brief was written, that is the language in Kansas statute. So now to Senator Erickson's point, um, federal law, IDEA, I mean, we could have, uh, we could add to this list of actions, another point that is aimed at the federal government's um, meeting their obligation under IDEA to, to um, increase funding for special education. I mean, I would, I would be very comfortable with that if, if we want that as a companion to the actions of um, the Kansas level of things. Uh, you know, these actions are addressed to the governor and the legislature, mm -hmm. and that's really who we have have the ability to address. So I, I guess what I where I'm coming from is I appreciate what the senator's saying. I don't want there may be disputes around some 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 of these terms, uh, but if that's what the statute says, I'm comfortable leaving it. But I do I do. I like reasonableness. If excess costs are part of the issue, if how people are reporting it are part of the issue, if the federal government not paying their share of it's part of the issue, I would hope that as we advocate, we would keep those things in mind. Uh, but I'm comfortable leaving the language. But I, I, I've learned something and I appreciate the Senator bringing these points up. So I'm okay leaving the language as I understand the situation. And Kim, this is John Wilson, and I, I too appreciate uh, Senator Erickson, your perspective and you elevating the current debate. 
I, I uh, given that these are not the formal recommendations of the cabinet members or of the cabinet, and because it reflects the current statutory language, I, I would like to keep it. And I also feel a little bit uncomfortable retroactively addressing fact sheets as if we've made a mistake when what, when what has changed has just been uh, some, some folks understanding of what that calculation means. So I, I would prefer to keep it because I, 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 again, I think it's reflecting the facts on the ground right now as reflected in statute. Anybody else want to add a point? Has everyone had a chance to speak? I would, I'm comfortable with the current wording. Okay. It's Monica. All right. Are there, um, um, I think it was a good discussion. I learned some things. I appreciate it. Um, are there um, uh, anything else about the report? Questions, discussions before we have a motion? We, we need to formally adopt this. Does, it could be as amended if you have amendments to make, so. Well, and so if, if, if before we get to the vote, the second area would be the formal cabinet recommendations. This is our final opportunity for 2022 ahead of the, the budget process, the legislative session, I, so this would be an opportunity to bring forward any additional recommendations that any of the members of the cabinet would like entertained as part of our formal recommendations for the year. Okay. Uh, I have, this is John Wilson. I have a few if, if, if folks are interested. Uh, and, and if you've been on the cabinet for a bit, you'll, uh, this might sound a little uh, repetitive, but I, but I still think it's important. Uh, so the first one that I'd want to um, uh, want the cabinet to consider is um, around making sure that kids and families have access to the programs and services that support their basic needs. And so uh, we've, we've done this recommendation, a form of this recommendation in the past. And so I've written it down just so I don't um, get too wordy here, but um, it would be that the cabinet recommends the governor and the legislature increase access to work and family support programs that help children and families meet their basic needs. Research clearly shows that children thrive when their basic needs are met and that parents and caregivers are better able to support children when their own basic needs are met. The cabinet believes current restrictions to child care assistance, cash assistance, nutrition assistance, and health insurance programs undercut the investments made through the CIF and blunt the efficacy of early childhood care and education programs. The 2019 Comprehensive Statewide Needs Assessment and 2021 Needs Assessment Update document these concerns. Okay. Uh, does anyone want to hear that again? Or we will hear it again before we act on it. But uh, do, do you have that well enough in mind? That uh, is there a second uh, to adding that as a recommendation? So John, John, before we allow a second, I, I just want to clarify, this is language that we have moved in the, the pri prior, last year, this was in our recommendations. This is the same language? Yeah, um, it's yes, yes. Okay. So Kim, I'll second, it's Monica, but I have, I have clarifying questions. All right, we will accept your second and we're open to your clarifying question. So John, I remember this from before, again, trying to put the pieces together, but this, this is a, a broad picture recommendation that we continue to say, this is a holistic kind of deal here, mm -hmm. right? We need to be drawing down every kind of support there is for families, right? That's the, that's the premise. Yeah, that's the correct, because um, kids don't just need one thing in their lives to be successful. It is as I like to, I like to think of it like a recipe instead of a menu. If you're going to bake a cake, you need all the ingredients for that cake to turn out. Uh, if, if you're picking from a menu, you can say, I only want this. So this is acknowledging the recipe of supports that children and the people who care for children need. Uh, and it's basically summarizes the annual report we just approved, doesn't it? <laughs> Saying uh, we have all this data and it took all of these things to get us to here. 
Isn't that the connection? Yeah, actually, yeah, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great point. And it, and it reflects what you highlighted on that page too, or what is highlighted by the data and the finding on that page. And for, for, for those kind of new to the issue, I need to share that um, uh, there are um, many of the programs that support kids and families in Kansas are federally funded programs that have federal requirements and rules. Some programs uh, allow states to add additional uh, requirements to them. And in Kansas, we have some uh, re requirements that are very difficult for families to meet. And so I think uh, as advocates and people who care about the health and well-being of kids, we need to encourage lawmakers to examine any potential barriers that exist to accessing food, food assistance programs or accessing the child care assistance program or um, getting cash assistance should they fall on hard times. Because we know from all of the evidence uh, documented over the years through CIF work and then nationally that when kids grow up in households with toxic levels of stress, it impacts the development of their brain and can have long-term costly consequences. I, it, John, I, just to clarify what people are seeing on screen is the language of this recommendation in writing. Lindsay, is it possible to make it a little bit larger um, for my tired there? So, so this is the, the the language just so you know people can process it um, after having heard it now you see the words and and I guess so it's not word for word because it references a 2021 yeah um, right I thought you added a new needs assessment but other than, other than that it's the wording correct okay further discussion did we get a second we did Monica seconded sorry is there further discussion? Questions? All right, I'm going to call roll on this. Can you bring back a roll call vote for me? All right, the motion is to add this as a recommendation in our annual report that would go uh, as, as a formal recommendation uh, based on our experience of our programming. We're recommending that. Uh, uh, these the changes be made to improve access to these basic need programs supporting families. So, uh, Senator Erickson? Yes. Uh, Lietta? Yes. Deanne? Yes. Delise? Yes. Monica? Yes. Uh, has Terry joined us? I don't believe Doc so. Dr. Ta Ta Smith? Yes. John? Yes. And myself, yes. All right, thank you. All right, uh, are there other uh, suggested additions to the recommendations? I have, I have one more, if that's okay. All right. Uh, indulge me here. Um, a, a much, much shorter recommendation here, uh, and it has to do with uh, our uh, the the federal program. Uh, it's called the Child Care and Development Block Grant. It's the federal source of funding for our child care assistance program in Kansas. And uh, in order to qualify for CCDBG funds, the state has to put up a match. And currently, um, our match is derived from CIF dollars, but we aren't putting up enough state match to fully draw down all available federal funds to support child care affordability and accessibility, which is at crisis levels in Kansas. And so I would like to have a recommendation that the state put in state general fund dollars to um, draw down the remaining federal CCDBG funds for which we're eligible. So that recommendation would be that the cabinet recommends the governor and the Kansas legislature contribute state general fund dollars to fully draw down matching child care and development block grant funds from the federal level. And that amount, I believe, is uh, about $3.4 million needed in state general funds. And is that subject to a 50-50 match, or do you know, John? That's, that, is, that, is, that is the kind of additional chunk of change that we need to pull down the remainder of, of our funds. And, and I'm, trying, I'm trying to see the feds do dollar for dollar on that, or do you know? No, they don't. It's um, a formula. Um, we send some CIF dollars to DCF to do this. We just don't have additional ability to, to increase that transfer. So I guess that, John, that's the rationale for state general fund dollars. 
yes. Yep, okay. Exactly. And I think um, I, I've, I've pulled up some info on this. It looks to me like a, it, in DCF calculations and, and I'm not sure. Um, I know Carla had a hard stop at 10. I don't, Ta Tanya is on the call, so, um, Deputy Secretary Keys. Uh, then if you could corroborate this, what, what I'm seeing is that 1.47 million roughly um, of state general fund dollars would match, it, it would allow us to draw down 2.26 million more in federal funds, which would give us 3.7 million more total ability to, to deploy um, those, those CC, DF dollars to, to help um, cover childcare costs. It, it, I know I know we weren't expecting this. Um, yeah, Secretary I, Keys, is, does that sound right? It does sound right. Thank you. I know there were a, a few different scenarios uh, that were put together. Those those figures do sound right, and you know certainly we can refine those figures. But yes, I believe what you're describing is uh, what we would currently describe as a conversation around that. Great. Thank okay, you. Thank you. I, the, the chair interrupted with a question before the chair got a second. Is there a second to John's motion? This is Delise. I'll second that. All right. Thank you. Well, I thought uh, wh whatever the actual numbers are is something certainly worth taking a look at in light of the, the pressing childcare needs around the state. So uh, uh, that, that satisfies me. Anything else? Are there other questions here on this recommendation? Well, Kim, it's not a question, but it's a further statement of my own recommendation. And is that, and that's, um, you know, the, the Children's Initiative Fund is made possible by people who smoke and use tobacco products. And as that decreases, we have uh, fewer funds available to invest in high quality evidence-based early childhood interventions. And so I think this is a great opportunity for the state to start building its muscle in contributing state general fund dollars to building the type of uh, experience we want every child in Kansas to have. And at a time from looking, I mean, uh, there are certainly many needs out there, but we are, we are entering a legislative session where we have uh, a budget surplus that is gonna be debated on its use. And I don't think you could find a better use for surplus funds than investing in children in the most critical years of their development. All right. Thanks, John. I think that whole issue you raise is uh, this issue of the declining funding of the CIF fund is uh, something we don't want to lose track of, especially if we think about a retreat for this year. I think we need to start getting way more strategic. This sounds like a, a, a small step in that direction. Other, other discussion? Questions? We have a motion before us, and I think I'll call a roll call vote on this one as well to add a formal recommendation. Senator Erickson. Yeah, well, I'm not opposed at all. I just know that when it comes to funding, there's always a lot more complicating factors and I just don't feel like I have enough information at this point, so I will pass. Okay, uh, Lietta? Yes. Deanne? Yes. Delise? Yes. Monica? Yes. Uh, Terry, still not with us. Dr. Smith? Yes. John? Yes. Myself? Yes. All right. Thank you, everybody. Anything further on recommendations or changes to the report? Kim, this is Monica again. Um, so my, I, I don't, I'm going to try to summarize this as best I can. I feel like the cabinet in, I think this is the place to do it is to include in a recommendation somewhere simply saying that as we look at issues of kids health and well-being that we are always looking to evidence-based data uh, evidence-based practices that we are always looking to data and research to support what we do um, and rather than maybe what's the, the flavor of the day or the, the thought of the day. And, you know, this really came to mind a lot during 
you know, the last several years as everybody became a doctor and everybody had an opinion on everything. Um, I, I feel like we need to make a statement that says that we are, we are interested in policies, rules, regulations, whatever it is that are centered in, in data and research when it comes to kids' health and well-being. And so I, I feel like somewhere in here, I don't think we said anything like that before. Um, I'd like to know, especially, especially from the good doctor on the call, um, if that is, is, am I right in thinking that a simple statement saying that the cabinet supports the efforts that are data-centered and research-centered when it comes to kids' health and well-being? Hello, yes, I would definitely concur that that would be important so that way people know that um, this information is coming from evidence-based resources and also that we would be able to provide people with those resources because I know some people do like to look at the data and statistics and the numbers and wanting to make sure that it's not just information that people are just kind of pulling out of the air knowing that we're not, but um, it just allows us to be accountable for that information so that way people know where the information is coming from. And I feel like we made a, thank you, doctor. Uh, I, I appreciate your opinion because like I said, everybody thinks they're a doctor, but you, are, you actually are and see real life kids. So um, maybe a, a simple recommendation. I'll say, I'll try to put it together here and then I'll put it in the form of a motion. Um, the cabinet representing the best interest of children recommends that the best available data and research drive regulation safe regulations safeguarding the health and well-being of children. So it's pretty generic, but it it also always keeps us as the, at the table as those conversations are happening. And did the secretary uh, get Monica's wording? Yeah, yeah. try again. I did. I have okay. one. Yeah, the cabinet so rep representing the best interest of children recommends the best available data and research drive regulations safeguarding the health and well-being of children. And I, I will tell you, Dioga still takes shorthand and is amazing. I got so. the language. Yeah. She got it the first time. <laughs> That's like right. When I was trying to put it, you know, out of my mouth there. So She's I make that in the form of a motion. Mr. Oh, Dioga, oh. I, 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 I take shorthand as well, if I, if, but I have to be able to transcribe it within uh, 30 seconds or I don't know what I wrote. So anyway, um, we'll trust yours is better. Uh, that, is there a second to Monica's motion? This is John. I second it. All right, John seconds it. I think the intent is clear. It is just to underline the importance of data and evidence and the making of decisions about uh, children's programming through laws and regulations. So data is our brand as you all have seen over the course of our meetings this year. So um, I appreciate this, Monica. May I please make a friendly amendment to the motion for Monica, just to add an evidence-based research only so that way people know that it's evidence-based because a lot of people do research out there, but it's not based on evidence. <laughs> will, will, will you accept friendly that amendment. friendly amendment? I would accept that. Thank and you. The second seems to as well, if I'm reading the nod on the... On the this is John. Yes, I do. All right. Yes, we live in... We live in a world where we need evidence and finding evidence from sources we can trust is always the, seems to be the issue these days. All right, uh, any further discussion? If not, um, I don't, uh, do you want me to call roll on this consistently, Melissa? Sure, I guess I yeah, sure. All right, all those in favor of this recommendation, uh, Senator Erickson? Yes. Lietta? Yes. Deanne? Yes. Delise? Yes. Monica? Yes. Dr. Smith? Yes. John? Yes. Myself? Yes. All right. We have taken more votes today than we have taken in any other meeting of uh, the cabinet. So I, I, I want, so, but I'm open to continuing. What other recommendations or changes in the report? Good work, everybody.
Hearing none, I'm open to a motion to adopt this report. And I think that in effect directs staff to uh, finish and distribute. So it would be adopt the report as amended. As amended. Yeah, it sure would be. Is there such a motion? Among us. This is Lietta. So moved. Lietta moves. Is there a second? Second, Tyler Smith. All right, Dr. Smith seconds. Now, any final discussion, words of wisdom? If not, I will again call roll. Uh, all in favor of this motion to adopt as amended, Senator Erickson. Are we adopting the amendment or the report? I'm sorry. We're, we're, adopting, the, we're adopting the report as amended. As amended, okay. Um, no. Okay, Lietta? Yes. Deanne? Yes. Delise? Yes. Monica? Yes. Dr. Smith? Yes. John? Yes. Myself? Yes. All right. Thank you all. I appreciate uh, the, the good discussion we've had and uh, the learning we've had. And, and again, thank you to the staff for all the good work that's accomplished. And we look forward in the ways you'll use this to further uh, the work of children and families in Kansas. So thank you all for your work on that. All right. Uh, Melissa, I think we're turning to you for a update on the preschool development grant. Absolutely. Thank you all. Um, good discussion. And um, I'm excited to get the report locked down and, and um, put to bed for the year. So thank you to all concerned. Um, preschool development grant is, um, we are we are in the final six months of the third year of the three-year grant cycle for the implementation grants. And we, um, we are beginning, as, as you saw in the core competency discussion this morning, we are beginning to see um, projects that have been underway come to fruition. So it's been a, a really exciting time and um, I, lots of great, great work it has been and is still being accomplished with, with those additional resources. We also this fall, um, I think we mentioned this at our October meeting, we were hard at work writing a new um, grant application. There is an opportunity that the, um, the Administration for Children and Families at the federal level made to continue the work of preschool development grants. They are, are pulling back to a planning grant opportunity as opposed to an implementation grant. So it, it's a chance for states that have been doing this work to reassess where they are and, and um, address um, you know, new and different needs that, that next layer of, of, of work that, that might enhance what has already been been done. The due date for the grant application was November 7th of 22. And the intention at the federal level is to get the grant awards made before the end of December, so that the grant year will run from December 30th to December 29th, 2023. So a one year um, um, unit of time to take do another comprehensive needs assessment to update our our five year strategic plan. We we are you know we adopted that plan in 2020. We have started accomplishing um, a, a wide range of goals that that we outlined in that plan. So it's time to assess the path forward. So this this grant is is potentially going to be very helpful. In, in that kind of work. The um, total amount that they have to award at the federal level is I think in the neighborhood of 36 million-ish. I, I am, it's, it's 36 or 37 million. Um, they, the intention announced was to make 10 grant awards of a range between 500,000 and 4 million. We went ahead and wrote an application for, full, for the full $4 million, um, knowing full well that, that there might need 
to be adjustments made if we are lucky enough to be awarded, but but awarded an amount less than the four million. So we we've tried to create some some room um, to to make some adjustments if needed. There are 27 states competing or or who were eligible for app applying for this grant. It we do not have knowledge of how many of those eligible states submitted applications, but that tells you how competitive this award cycle is. Um, so we are very, very proud of the proposal put together and um, the, the, um, the way that it builds on the, the prior four years of, of preschool development grant work. So we're, we are, very optimistic about the way our application will land and, and hope for the best. So we, as I said, we will update the needs assessment to um, analyze the world of existing needs assessments from other organizations, understand the impact of COVID and the COVID relief funding on our early childhood care and education mixed delivery system. Um, we, and we proposed a, a survey of the work force or, or using the, the surveys that have been done. Um, the, our tomorrow stories, having community engagement sessions, et cetera. The strategic plan is um, to take those needs assessment findings and translate them into the next iteration of a strategic plan for early childhood. That effort will uh, be just as collaborative as the, the first round with, with all of the the necessary agencies and outside partners at the table, including parents with, with young children and, and um, the voice of lived experience. We, um, the, the third activity outlined in the grant um, RFP is that um, a request that we have activities to maximize parent and family engagement. So we have a, a proposal to do a, a project. We, it replicates what we did with child care providers. We did a provider experience mapping project. We interviewed 400 child care providers to, to gain insight into their experience um, uh, with the licensing process and, and, and professional development and, and what it's like to work in their profession. So we proposed a family experience mapping process where we would similarly um, engage with parents and, and take input in a very intentional and, and um, um, a, a approachable way to, to give us good insight into what families themselves have to say, not just about their experiences, but what would help them um, with the challenges that they face raising their children. So we're excited about that. Um, activity four was um, to design um, a plan to support the birth to five workforce and disseminate best practices. So we have a, a and we cannot engage in this until the needs assessment and strategic plan have been submitted to the feds as a, a, as a grant deliverable item. And only then can we go ahead and, and address the, the workforce. But, um, we have a pilot that would pick some communities that that we would um, do some some work to um, uh, um, on recruitment retention and um, multi some outreach to multi payer models that um, would be community partnerships. So it's it's an idea that we have been been working to, to bring to fruition. So this would give us the chance to actually put a pilot out in, into a couple communities. And the, finally, um, support for overall quality improvement. Um, so this would involve um, helping distribute the Kansas Early Learning Standards and enhancing family engagement and partnership standards for early childhood. I will say that part of the needs assessment and strategic planning will be um, to assess 
the the system itself, the the overall early childhood care and education mixed delivery system that is spread across at least four different state agencies. So we we have been very interested in how we best align and and maximize the resources that exist. Um, so that is the status of the grant. Um, by the time we meet in February, it will be known and we will be uh, two months in to or, or at least a month into the work should we be awarded a grant um, and I, we will be sure to make an announcement once we hear something from the feds. Um, I am, I think um, a, another component of, of achievement is um, the milestone with regard to the workforce registry. We have been talking about this with you, telling you the RFP is out there, the applications have been reviewed, the contract is pending for the better part of 2022. It is a data system that we are, are proposing. It's an IT project. The state procurement process is very detailed and very specific when it comes to that type of project because we had to go through a lot of review and a lot of, of vetting and supervision from Department of Administration and the Kansas Office of Information Technology, lots of statutory requirements when it comes to a project of this nature. So that process, I, I, I characterized it earlier this week that I was able to um, both incubate and give birth to a, an actual human being in less time than this contract took to birth, but I think all of that due diligence is incredibly important. And I am delighted to announce that the, the contract was fully executed and awarded this week. And that work is immediately getting underway to um, build a, a workforce registry for the Kansas early childhood um, child care workforce as the starting point. Um, so it, this will be part of a trio of tools that are designed to support the, the child care workforce and, and help them with their, their professional training and, and their career development and, and the management of all of their credentials. Um, it will bring us into the digital age with regard to the tracking of the hours required each year for continuing education. It will give the providers themselves an easy way to catalog and track the, the, the things they do to, to in their own career development. And it will, um, it, it will allow the licensing process. It is one more step in making that process easier for all concerned to manage. So that is the biggest announcement with regard to the workforce registry that we've had all year. And by, by the end, by fall, we should be testing the, the, the um, registry and, and rolling it out before the end of 2023. That is one piece, the, the core competencies is, is one part. The workforce registry is the second part. And then I, I want to invite Hannah White from the cabinet team. She is our workforce development coordinator um, for the cabinet. Um, Hannah is going to explain to you where we are with the development of the Kansas Child Care Career Pathway. And this too is, is um, really exciting news. So Hannah. Thank you, Melissa. Um, thank you all for having me here today. Uh, as I'm sitting here, I'm actually seeing emails come in from the core competencies subgroup and they're just elated. So thank you for the time. Thank you for the approval. Um, it's been a labor of love. So I have been on this career pathway project for um, the entirety of the project, so about two years now. Um, you may know that we've been working very closely with all of our state partners, um, including um, the agencies that you're familiar with, as well as our contracted um, entities like Child Care of Kansas and Casido. Um, so this process has been very intentional. Um, we've had um, feedback directly from, from the field and um, um, very uh, continuous feedback from our shareholders at the state and systems level. So super excited that we are finally here. Um, 
we have a, a final CURB pathway um, and that we are going to be ready to present to the workforce first of the year. We are finishing up the um, final iterations of some artifacts that go with that. So what you're looking at here um, is what will be the All In For Kansas Kids website. Um, if you look at the top there, that heading at the top that says families, this will actually be under providers. And um, this is a mock-up that was created by our contractor, Orange Sparkle Ball. They've done a lot of great work for us. Um, so the All In For Kansas Kids website is going to contain resources and links to all things strategic plan and the career pathway will live there as well. So we are releasing the career pathway into the world at the end of this month. Um, what we've created on this website is um, you can see that there's some editorial text that explains the purpose of the pathway, why it matters not only to our child care providers, but to the system at large. Um, we have an interactive tool that kind of walks through uh, what it's going to look like. And then we have, as you can see, just kind of general information um, and tips for use. So we can go ahead and go to the next page. So the purpose of um, this landing page and the web page in general is to give providers and our work fit workforce a way to interact with and be introduced to the career pathway um, with a very low dollar investment. So we are releasing it as a standalone tool. Um, in the future, there's going to be technical assistance that goes along with it to help providers navigate the career pathway and figure out where they are. Um, but for right now, we are releasing it as a standalone tool, as I said, uh, with frequently asked questions, tips for use, and, and just kind of explaining how this connects to the larger projects that Melissa um, explain like core competencies, um, the workforce registry, etc. So the career pathway itself is incredibly integral to the workforce registry because it will dictate the progression of advancement for our professionals. Um, as you can see, we have on the left side and the right side, we have um, valued both higher education as well as those professional learning experiences that are not dictated by higher education. Um, one of the guiding principles that we've been working with this entire time is just equity and access. Um, so we tried to be as uh, inclusive and representative of the diversity of our workforce as possible. Um, we've included a number of really high quality credentials that we, um, that we rely on in our state as part of this career pathway, including the CDA, um, including the infant mental health endorsement. Um, we also have national director's credentials that are aligned um, and the um, NAFC accreditation, which is accreditation for family child care providers. So there's a lot of work that's been done to make sure our existing credentials in Kansas are aligned to our career pathway. Um, and we've also done the work to ensure that future alignment with uh, NAEYC and power to the profession is possible. We are not there yet, but we have worked out how it could align. So first of the year, what we're anticipating is releasing um, the pathway on this All In For Kansas Kids website. Um, we've been doing a lot of um, communication through our channels, through our state partners um, to prepare the workforce for this happening. Actually, the early childhood group that I am um, hosting later, we're gonna do the full unveiling. Um, and if you can't see on my face how excited I am about this, just use your imagination. It's been, it's been two full years of hard work and, um, and collaboration and convening with all the key players. So um, this tool, we're just, we're just super excited about it and we're very grateful to have um, one place that people can go to stay in touch with all things strategic plan, including these important workforce elements. Eventually, a lot of these components are going to be um, interfaced with primarily on the registry, but we're finishing up iterations. As I said, I believe the 14th is kind of our, um, we, we have to be ready to go with coding and everything that needs to go over to Trezolo to make sure it happens, but we are actually ahead of schedule, which is incredible. Um, so just very excited and, uh, we have a lot of things planned for the coming year of how we can um, work on implementation of the career pathway, uh, shore up, coaching, mentoring, all of those other really important components that the research and the process has told us uh, will contribute to the success of our workforce. So I am willing to answer any questions, um, but I just want to say a uh, big shout out to Orange Sparkle Ball and then also the team at Trezolo and of course KUCPPR because um, the Career Pathway team has a lot of ideas, but we are not great with visuals. So the, the appealing nature of this has nothing to do with us. Hannah, can you explain, like, and I guess my, my ask, Lindsay, again, is there a way you could enlarge the, this 
particular image so that people can see the pathway itself in just a bit more detail. While well, Hannah, can you explain the, the interactive nature and what happens when you click on one of those bars? Yeah, absolutely. So um, for example, if I was a, um, a high school student, maybe in a CTE program, we know that we have a, a high number of CTE programs that emphasize early childhood care and education in Kansas. So we've aligned that in the beginning of our pathway. So if you see there, that's actually level zero, that's our pre-professional. So if I were looking at this to try and figure out where I was, if you hover over each of those um, balloons, if you will, it will expand and it'll talk about the various uh, requirements um, for each level. So those include if there's a formal credential that's required, if there's an amount of professional learning hours, which would be um, not only the hours that are needed by regulation to stay licensed, but a, a little bit above and beyond to kind of increase that professionalism and increase some um, subject matter expertise beyond the basic um, requirements of licensing. Um, and then it also would illustrate if there's any on the job requirements. So the parameters for each side differ. Um, the higher education pathway, which is on the left, obviously has a heavier emphasis on higher education courses, um, whereas the professional learning side, um, the parameters that expand are primarily professional learning, on the job experience, and then if there's any um, um, field specific credential like the CDA. So a user can go through, they can print it in a flat version with everything expanded, but we've also created, well, not we, OSB has created this interactive tool where a person can see really as much or as little as they want um, without being very overwhelmed. This is a lot of information to digest. Um, but yeah, we're, we're excited and we, we've gotten a lot of feedback about the actual user experience. Um, so we feel confident that um, it'll be easy to navigate, easy to understand, and not overwhelming. Just very clear. Okay. I, I, I would just um, add that we, as a guiding principle, uh, I, I think Hannah mentioned that this we want this inclusive. Uh, I, that actually speaks to honoring both professionals who have pursued college coursework level um, credentials, as well as those providers who are in the profession and are licensed and doing their, their certificates and, and the continuing education hours required of them, but, you know, just wanting to do what's necessary. They love kids. They've, they're taking care of kids, but but they're not interested in college. We've honored both experiences and, and we want all of our existing workforce to see themselves in this pathway and not feel like they are suddenly being shut out. So there, there is something for everybody in this. You could enter this pathway at different points depending on your level of experience and it's it's meant to be an enhancement tool and and something that provides support and um, creates you know we talk a lot uh, when we're talking about workforce development programs about stackable credentials i i think this is this is our attempt to to put some organization around how you chart a course to growth in your profession as a child care provider. Absolutely, Melissa. And that is one thing I kind of forgot to articulate. Any one of these levels can be um, a provider can enter into the career pathway. So it does not have to be sequential. It, it can be sequential. A person could absolutely move from the CTE program and maybe all the way through um, a unified uh, early childhood degree, but it does not have to be. We know that our providers come from all walks of life. They come in with maybe a bachelor's in, in nursing or um, they come in with a CNA. Um, we have just such a diversity of experience. So uh, it can be used sequentially or progressively, but it does not need to be. This is a matter of information. I know some, one or more members may be, need to leave, and we are not anticipating any additional votes uh, by the cabinet at this point. So didn't mean to interrupt you guys, but I know there was a question that I thought better be answered uh, online. So, all right. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, uh, I'm anxious to be able to 
to hit these balloons and see what pops up here for me. So, uh, but it, it looks, uh, it looks, uh, it looks great. So, all right, agency updates. Uh, let's see, do you have me a list of people available? Well, we do, what do you know? Um, Hannah, we're gonna turn to you first. I think uh, you're helping uh, uh, handle some things because uh, Amy may be absent today. So, um, all right. Yes, sir. So as you know, um, the primary update I have for you um, is that we are in an open application period for the early childhood block grants. We'll be accepting submissions until December 16th at 5 p.m. Um, we've been using the channels that we have, like the webinars um, and the obviously the, the biweekly um, emails to give as constructive um, information as possible to make some successful applications. I know that Amy Meek, our early childhood director, is already um, has been working on the review process and um, compiling that multi-reviewer uh, process for a few months now. So uh, once the submissions close December 16th, we will work through the process of reviewing applications and then formally submit them um, to you all in April at the cabinet meeting. So that is the only update that I have. All right, well, thank you. Uh, Amanda Peterson, I haven't seen her smiling face, but I I don't know if her name's on here or not. Hello, Kim. Amanda, are you here? Yeah. There you are. All right. Absolutely. So I have three pieces to share with all of you today, and I know it's been a lot of a lot of learning. So I'll try to be quick. Um, thing number one is that if you're interested in staying up to date on information from the Kansas State Department of Education something that we're doing this year that I'm, I've been very excited by and pleased by is that our agency has a new newsletter that goes out every Thursday. It's called KSDE Weekly. And the intended audience is for school leaders and educators who are trying to stay up to date on um, the, the issues that, that our agency addresses. Obviously, there's a lot of work. And so this has been a terrific way, I think, to streamline communication. But something that's really exciting is that it's also an opportunity to highlight bright spots um, from around the state. So for example, on November 17th, we were able to share a really neat update from the Paola uh, Consortium of Parents as Teachers, who was doing a virtual um, Zoom series to celebrate World Nursery Rhyme Week. Uh, it was really inspiring. It was great to be able to see a real live example of how well, not a real life example, but be able to hear a tangible example of uh, how our schools are working to address early literacy and be able to share uh, a great idea that we think could be replicated elsewhere. So if you're interested in receiving those uh, email updates, you can email ksdeweekly, W-E-E-K-L-Y at ksde.org. Um, you'll also get a lot of information. Our, the, our, our early childhood team uses those to share out uh, updates related to program administration. So I think that's a terrific resource that folks might want to be aware of. Second, I want to share a quick update on the work that's underway to update the Kansas Early Learning Standards. Um, a core group of our early childhood partners from state agencies have been working on this for quite some time, since last February. And if you're not familiar, the Kansas Early Learning Standards is a document that provides information and guidance to early educators to help really um, understand the sequence of the developmental sequence of learning for young children. It's a really important resource as we consider how we can have some shared understanding uh, across settings in our state early childhood system. And the core team has been working together with content area specialists for the past several months to address each of the eight content areas. So these are things like mathematics, approaches to learning, communication, and literacy. Uh, they're more than halfway through, and they continue to work through those as they review and see. Uh, it's been some time since those have been reviewed and updated, so it's been a very good process so far, and we so appreciate the professional lenses that everybody is bringing to this work. Of course, Updating this work, updating the document is just one step. And so as we're updating the content areas, we're also considering from an overall perspective um, how they uh, address the diverse experiences of children and families. Um, and having this document complete will be just one step of the work. We'll also be considering once, once this is finalized, how we can make this really accessible and broadly distributed um, across Kansas so that a wide range of professionals can use these standards um, and not have this be just, you know, a really terrific document that sits on the shelf. 
So I so appreciate everybody who's been working as a part of that. If you are interested in getting engaged in that work, you can reach out to Natalie McLean uh, at the Kansas State Department of Education, and we are really excited for what's ahead. So if you're subscribed to the All In for Kansas Kids weekly emails, uh, if you're coming to our regular early childhood systems building meetings, you I, you can rest assured that you'll be hearing more about this in the future, but we've officially passed the halfway mark in terms of the uh, eight content areas that are being reviewed. So I wanted to share that update. And then finally, just a little bit about preschool funding. Um, for me, it's hard to believe that it's already December and that we're already looking ahead to the 2023-2024 school year, but we are. Uh, and our team is working to update the resources that we provide to school districts to help them budget and plan for their early childhood programming, particularly their preschool programming for, um, for upcoming years. And I've shared this before, but I'll take just a minute to emphasize here. When we think about our overall landscape of preschool funding in the state of Kansas. Certainly the competitive grant applications that, that we tend to talk about here, things like the Early Childhood Block Grant or the Kansas Preschool Pilot, I don't want to minimize that those are very important pieces of the puzzle. But as we're trying to put it in context, I think it's helpful to understand that other sources of funding, uh, specifically the school finance formula, also you know federal Head Start funds, are much larger uh, and, and more sustainable sources of funding when districts are considering how they can build a really good sustainable program. And so we are trying to help districts really connect those dots and understand you know, if I have this many preschool students who are enrolled, how much funding is that generating? How much is that changing from year to year? Um, starting in 2018, the legislature uh, amended the, the state school finance formula to allow three-year-old students who meet certain at-risk eligibility criteria to generate funding if they're enrolled in approved programs. Um, and starting for this upcoming school year, the base amount that helps determine the amount of funding that each uh, student or the accompanying weightings generate will start to increase based on inflation. So if this sounds all really technical and complicated, you know, it is a little bit. And, and part of what we do is help schools understand those pieces so that as they're building their programming, they can really understand the resources that they have available. Um, and then, of course, determine that they may have other resources available to make in a really worthwhile investment that will improve student outcomes later on. So our team's working to update those calculators and those presentations. Uh, we'll be sharing and continuing to collaborate with the Children's Cabinet as, as they work to support early childhood block grantees and applicants. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about that, you can visit ksde.org and at the nice alphabetical um, scroll at the top, if you select E for early childhood, then you can find all of those early childhood funding resources. So that's all I have for today, unless anybody has any questions. All right, let's see. Any questions or comments related to Amanda? All right, well, thank you. Glad you're with us again. Well, we're honored to have Secretary Stanek with us today. Uh, good morning, Secretary. Appreciate your joining us. No problem. Um, great, glad to see everyone. Um, Melissa, we had talked about us being on this meeting for, for December. It's not that I don't think your meetings are important, but um, can't be at every meeting. So rely on um, Amanda and others to, to kind of represent KDAG. Um, I have taken in a lot of information today that I was not familiar with, although Melissa has shared the report and so forth. So um, if there's any follow-up from us, we are trying to, um, I think, you know, work on more collaboration with the entire um, children's initiatives, I guess, for lack of a better word. And uh, so I look forward to working with you all. And I'm here to answer any questions if I can help. And I know Ashley's on as well. Ashley Goss. Thank you, Secretary. Did, are there um, any updates pertaining to child care that KDHE could, could offer us today? Um, just brief notes, or are we um, at a, in a place where we are, um, I, I know we've got a new director of child care licensing, Jarvis Dolman. Yes. Right. Yes. So, um, good things are happening. I, and with I would, um, Ashley, are you still on? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, so I would, I would defer to Ashley, but I would, I guess as the secretary, I will make this comment, um, along with Ashley, um, we have certain areas that, um, now that the dust has settled for me a year later, um, you know, I have different targets and different focuses and, and uh, obviously the child care area is of particular importance to us. Um, we have a lot of um, 
customers and stakeholders there and we want to make it a great experience and make sure that we're doing our part. We've been working diligently with the fire marshal's office and other other um, agencies to try to make sure that um, we're doing our part to be timely, efficient, and so forth. Um, Ashley, you can um, take it from here and talk about where we're at with structure and some of the things you're working on, please. Yep, sure. Hi, everyone. Ashley Goss, Deputy Secretary for Public Health. Um, I'm going to try and be able to be on these um, on your meetings more frequently along with Allison. Um, <clears throat> so, yes, we have a new child care director. Um, he is he has diving in um, and learning. Um, every day um, and he's he's doing a, a really great job. Um, we are in the process of adding additional staff. We've had some staff turnover um, and we are um, in the process of getting efficiencies um, that are in a better place. So there's that. But also, Melissa, I don't know if you are asking where we are with childcare regs, the new ones that have been proposed. Um, those are kind of a burning question. Um, I don't know if any of you were able to attend the public comment session, but there was an exceedingly amount, uh, exceedingly huge amount of public comments against the regulations. So um, we are taking that under review as we normally would. The team is drafting, putting together an organized document of those of the comments, um, and they will be presented back to Janet and I once they have been completed. But it is not promising. Um, I think that there's probably a lot of misunderstanding still that. Um, even though we increase the number of children that you, that it's still an option, you are not forced to do it, um, but we knew this going in. So we'll see where we land with that. Um, we don't have that document back yet. There were several, several comments. And so if you need additional information, I know Allison is on and she's kind of overseeing that as well, but that's where we're at right now with that. I'm super excited. We are getting positions filled within that program. Um, and developing tighter procedures and things like that to ensure quicker turnaround with licensing. Thank you. So Ashley, to clarify, are you are you saying the feedback through the, the public input portion of this process is, is it coming, can you discern, is it coming from the providers themselves? I have not seen the feedback. Allison, if you're okay. still on, if you have that information, do you want to comment? I am. Yeah. So um, I did review the public comments. I read them all one by one. Um, most of the comments did come from child care providers themselves. And then we had five or six um, statewide partners who submitted um, written testimony as well. So I think there were probably between 50 and 60 child care providers who shared their opinion. Thank you. I also have, um, I know last meeting that I was at, you wanted child care bonus updates. Do you, would you like? That'd be great if you're okay. equipped, yep. Yeah, so um, as of this Monday, November 28th, we've had uh, just under 12,500 applications which equates to about $26 million. Um, and fiscal still working on pushing those out the door, but they're doing a great job um, as of right now. So how, how long is the eligible period to apply? It is, is that closing? It is, December 10th is the last day for the last application to come in for any of the um, categories that anyone would fall under. So December 10th is the last day, and then we'll take some time afterwards to wrap up sending payments to those who are still pending. So I would I would think it would behoove all of us to help promote the program in its final um, few days. There's one more week left, so um, I'll pledge that we will push out a link to the application on our social media for the Children's Cabinet and would encourage our other partners and those listening to help promote this too, to help make sure the child care workforce understands this is still an option to apply and, and something that would be of financial benefit to them. Awesome. Yeah, there you. is plenty of funding to handle additional applications. I've, yes, lost, the, I've lost those numbers in my head. Yep. Yes, okay. there is. Okay. Well, I would just wanna say that uh, for my four years on this, uh, this group, uh, Secretary Stanick, one of the great things has been the the cooperation and the collaboration and the attention from KDHE. So I just want to appreciate what sounds like your continuing uh, pledge to 
yes to have that happen and we all know that child care is in the focus these days there are um, you know lots of difficult issues to resolve uh, we're going to appreciate your balancing of that uh, I, I know here in Hutchinson they've had the uh, I, I, I've understood that there have been regulatory issues and I'm sure they've been raised from Hutchinson uh, and I know they're not easy, so we do appreciate you guys and the work you're trying to do to uh, balance this all out with the safety, health, and then the accessibility of childcare. It is, it is a, it's, it's a stretch, I know. So we appreciate your work. We appreciate your collaboration. Yeah, I just say that we are really trying to, and I don't have a current status, maybe Ashley does, but trying to do more proactive, um, get out there now that we're in a better place with COVID, education about um i know that we have some education that's in place for existing daycare or child care providers but if you want to be a child care provider trying to get out ahead of that to avoid some of the potholes that you're describing the safety regulatory and it's so um vast it's it's too much to describe depending on what kind of provider that you are so we have had a lot of discussions about being more proactive with that and getting back on track. And so I'm excited about um, our continued work together as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Appreciate KHE. All right, uh, Tanya, you have been sticking with us today. Uh, you have a report from DCF. <clears throat> thank you. Hi, everyone. Just a couple of updates, I think, to complement some of the, uh, the information that you received earlier. Uh, DCF hopes soon to be able to announce. Uh, we had put out a request for proposal for family resource centers across the state, and we've been reviewing those proposals. We hope to announce uh, those family resource centers this calendar year. It might uh, spill over into January, but we hope to be able to share that. And those family resource centers would be hubs that are community-based and agencies that can be a collection of supports uh, for parents, families, youth, and others that help with their basic needs and relational needs. So uh, definitely ties in with some of what you've been talking about today. The other update is uh, we also have, uh, we are nearing completion for our family first request for proposal period. So we're in our second iteration. It's hard to believe uh, for family first prevention services. And so we uh, hope also hope to be able to announce our family first prevention service providers that would then start next fiscal year. Um, among the, the those family first prevention services are those for parent education, parent skill building, including home visiting, which you all saw the impact today of how important those programs are. So we're really pleased to be able to continue that and complement that. And we hope to announce very soon. And that, those are the only two updates I have uh, in terms of the context of what you all have been listening to and celebrating today. Well, we're, we're, we're nearing the end and we don't have time for reminiscence, but you're getting one anyway. Um, 35 years ago, I and four or five trustees from the United Methodist Health Ministry Fund traveled up north into Southern Nebraska to visit this strange thing called a family resource center because we were interested in what that might mean for Kansas. So I just wanna say, uh, I'm anxious to see these things uh, actually in Kansas and uh, look forward to, to, to that because I think they are, they, they, they can play a critical role. So we'll look forward Tanya to seeing how that all rolls out and uh, where they are and uh, our ability for people to use them. So thank you for that update. I think Carla Wiscom may be absent today. And Melissa, did you though have a brief update? Uh, she just she, she did send me her regrets for missing the meeting, and she asked that I share that the Board of Regents is really busy focused on the system wide general education um, package. And there is a website which we will make sure to circulate to all of you and and um, include in the minutes so people know what we're talking about, but it is on the Board of Regents website, which is kansasregents.org. Um, under academic affairs, there is a, a place where you can find more information about the general education um, unit that they are, are working on. So we will make sure to share that on their behalf. 
And as a trustee of a private college, I think the private colleges of Kansas have all entered into similar uh, matriculation agreements. I think the, the point of it is to make it easier. Colleges for sure. So yeah, to um, transfer credit, so there's less need the less duplication of effort and and it's it's a cost savings to our students and it's just a more unified approach that a, a general education class in the agreed upon framework that you take at one institution is transferable elsewhere so they're working on what that shared agreement looks like is is my understanding all great news all right uh, the honorable retained justice wall may want to speak to us uh, <laughs> thanks thanks kim i appreciate that um i just wanted to talk briefly about the rural justice initiative that our court kicked off yesterday and i promise there is a tie-in to the cabinet even though it may not be apparent on on the surface but this committee is addressing the shortage of attorneys in rural kansas and barriers to accessing justice in the rural parts of our state and by rural I mean, both rural and frontier, if anybody is questioning what the definition might be. Um, and we, you know, we have many counties in our state that um, may have no attorneys um, and, and dozens that have just a handful. And it, that can be very problematic in a number of ways. But just for example, in a, in a child in need of care case, it, it, it's not uncommon that you will have numerous parties. You may have uh, separated parents or divorced parents. So you have a mom, a dad, uh, grandparents who may uh, be involved, foster parents, um, a guardian ad litem. And all of them may want to have conflict-free counsel. And quite honestly, it's almost impossible to um, accomplish that in many areas of our state um, uh, to, to find attorneys to a point in that situation that wouldn't have conflicts. And then it leaves many of those parties in a position of proceeding without counsel, uh, which, which uh, it can be problematic in and of itself. Um, that's, that's just an example. But this committee, I'm very excited about. It's um, a broad group of stakeholders. We've got uh, Kansas 4-H, we've got Farm Bureau, the Kansas Chamber, uh, rural prosperity, legislators, attorneys, judges, all trying to hone in and focus on this issue. And it's interesting that what we've been hearing already are barriers that um, should sound very familiar to the cabinet. Uh, first and foremost, child care availability is an enormous issue for uh, recruiting attorneys, younger attorneys to um, these areas that are you know, some, some folks call legal deserts and um, uh, STEM opportunities and, and early childhood development programs are, are actually, we're hearing anecdotally, but very frequently are a significant barrier um, that's complicating this problem, housing, labor shortages. So issues that are covered in this annual report, um, John's second um, uh, recommendation today touched on the issue. KDHE's update as well. Um, and I, I'm just really excited to tackle this issue. But I found it interesting that a lot of these barriers are, are sounded so similar to the issues that we discuss here. And so I think it's interesting that, um, you know, we've, we've got different groups sort of uh, um, trying to tackle these issues, but maybe from different perspectives. So that's, that's just what I wanted to share today. Justice Wall, this is Melissa. I would just um, flag for you that part of the, the community-based child abuse prevention grant work that we are engaged in is um, to provide funding for uh, what we call preventive legal services to families. Those are those issues that, um, you know, in a, a, a family where the, the, the there may be traffic violations or, or housing, you know, lease legal issues or, or any number of things in within the context of the family that begin to create stress and and 
and build to crisis if jobs get lost because somebody can't get to work because uh, you know what what one thing leads to another or a family loses their home and oftentimes there are are available remedies in those situations if you had some legal guidance on behalf on, you know representing the interests of the family so we have been working with Kansas legal services and, and a couple organizations on some pilots to help fund additional attorney capacity and I, we had some delay getting the pilot off the ground, particularly in Southwest Kansas for exactly this reason. So I am very appreciative of the work that's being done to draw some attention to it and agree there is um, there is connectedness to all of our issues. So if we can be helpful to the committee and, and the work that that is being done, please reach out and let us know. That's great to know, and um, we'll definitely do that. And I know um, Ms. Harp is, uh, from Kansas Legal Services is on our committee, um, so great. that'll be a good tie-in as well. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. I am unmuted, aren't I? Yes. My screen's giving me mixed messages here. Um, well, uh, welcome uh, Matthew Billinger from uh, Juvenile Justice Oversight. I saw him earlier. Are you still with us, Matthew? I am. I'm here. Thank you. So th this is my first meeting. I'm stepping in um, Hope for Hope Cooper, who recently left. I'm pretty sure Hope Cooper was like a professional committee member, so I don't expect the same level of um, that, that Hope probably delivered to you. But um, I do work with the Juvenile Justice Oversight Committee. We just finished up our annual report and published it a couple of days ago. So your earlier conversations brought back some great memories um, and quite impressed with your parliamentary procedure. So good job, Chair Moore. Um, some of the things we've been working on over the past year, um, we are developing some innovation grants and we're hoping that by next month, those will be able to be um, pushed out and begin to get applied for where we're offering agencies more opportunities and grant funding to initiate some programs to help those justice involved youth um, and address those risk areas in the community. Um, so it's, I think it's five, three million dollar grants um, that will provide a little bit less constraints than some of the more traditional grants we offer and kind of help get new programs off the ground. And then that can later be sustained by some of our other grant opportunities. Another thing we did was work with the Opiate Response Network, um, looking at Kansas's substance abuse um, treatment as well as behavioral health care, and kind of gave got us some feedback about how we address justice-involved youth with that. And with that information, we've um, partnered up with some people at DCF, KDHE, and KDADS to kind of take a deeper dive into that, um, see what kind of opportunities exist to address some of those issues, as well as how the Juvenile Justice Oversight Committee can assist in addressing a lot of that. Um, so we've partnered up with those people and still kind of having preliminary dives into what that information tells us, but looking in the next year to see what opportunities exist for us. Okay. Currently, um, one of our big pushes for calendar 2023 is going to be a lot of awareness. Um, we're getting a lot of feedback that, you know, there's still a lot of agencies and groups out there that aren't aware of this evidence-based practice fund that's available. Um, so as my first meeting here today, I guess I'll, I'll ask, um, we are looking for distribution email lists, newsletters, community boards that we can um, kind of advertise or, or get awareness out of these evidence-based practice funds because year after year, there is still money left on the table that um, doesn't get applied for. So we're looking to get those out. Of course, it's justice-involved youth. So um, I know many of you may not have a lot of involvement with those, but I'm sure you're probably connected to some that are. So um, we're more than I'm sorry. Um, we're, I'd be more than happy to, to take any information or any email groups or anything you could give us um, so we can help spread that out. We're trying to kind of um, get that put out there and get it to um, more public facing opportunities or touching more organizations with that. Matthew, this is Melissa Rooker from the Children's Cabinet. I, I would offer that we 
we have a weekly email update to the, the world of childcare providers. If you do a, a brief write-up and, and provide us some information, we can include that in our distribution and elevate that for you through our network. Would be great. Yeah, we're, we're getting right. We're putting together like a one-page flyer. Perfect. Um, that we can advertise, but we can also write up like a paragraph or two. That'd be great. All right, that's, that's, that's all that's, I had, unless you had any questions for me. All right. Well, we welcome you. Uh, we always enjoyed hope and uh, uh, in these meetings. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we developed, Matthew, was a sense that uh, uh, th there are many overlaps and uh, possibilities to work together with the Department of Corrections. And so we'll just uh, look forward to, to those opportunities as they come along. So. Appreciate, appreciate your participation today. Yep, I'd be happy to help in any way I can. Great. Well, that completes uh, the, the apparent list of agency updates, but let me check. Did somebody miss something or have anything else they'd like to bring up before we turn it over to Melissa? All right, Melissa, it's all yours. Thank you, Kim. Um, I appreciate the discussion today and, and all of the, the feedback that you've given and um, look forward to um, closing out the year, putting the re annual report to bed, just delivering it. I took the comments to heart about delivery approaches and, and we'll be um, acting on those suggestions. Um, in terms of any other updates that are left, I, I wanted to, to revisit the the June 24th cabinet recommendation regarding home visiting. Um, this cabinet adopted a recommendation to, um, to, to conduct a, a study of promising and evidence-based home visiting models in Kansas and support um, work on a statewide home visiting infrastructure with a variety of sustainable home visiting service options to meet the needs of Kansas um, children and their families. That We have eight or nine models in Kansas that are adopted across multiple um, different organizations. It's a very fragmented system, very important work as you see in the data and the results of, of our study about the impact of this work. Um, we, I'm delighted to, to bring you an update that, about the work that is underway on the study that, that you all recommended um, in, in collaboration with the state home visiting leadership team, which is part of the overall governance structure, we have been gathering information and and um, um, basically we we have we've had a community. The, the, there have been 450 families who've responded to a family survey. Um, 455 home visitation staff have responded to a workforce survey. We are in process producing a heat map of where the maternal child health home visiting services have reach by county based on the eligible population and the number of families served. And um, we are working on estimates of the number of families served by county for early Head Start and Head Start home visiting and parents as teachers home visiting based on local data provided. So we may not have every piece of data, but we are doing our level best to, to take in as much input as we can and gather as much data as possible. Um, and then we will take all of this work and um, um, combine it with other models um, in terms of county level data of number of families served to, to be able to map out where services are concentrated and where we have work to do as we begin the, the process of, of assessing um, what potential recommendations we might make to, to help reduce the, the fragmentation in the system is, is how I'll frame it. What we 
strive for and, and, and hope for and envision is a continuum of care with regard to home visiting services. They are of varying degrees of prescriptiveness in terms of the specificity of the type of support that they provide to families. It starts with universal, which is just a broad um, check-in with parents, and, and then there's a continuum of, of care depending on, on needs. We would love to actually create that continuum as a functioning process where any family that wishes could have um, the dream is two, two visits from a home visitor when they bring a new baby home. And then from there, if there is need to um, make referrals to other forms of, of, of home visiting for support, um, that, that that stems from those those initial meetings. So we will report back to you. We anticipate April at our meeting, we will have a report um, to, to, to present to you as, as the children's cabinet. I think the, the aside from all of the milestones that we've reached that you've heard about earlier in the meeting, I think the project that continues to be the, the greatest source of joy in, in my workday is the work that we do as the state lead on Dolly Parton's Imagination Library. Um, this is a coverage map of areas that have the library available to the families in their, in their um, this is arranged by zip code because the Dollywood Foundation organizes their whole program by zip code so the Postal Service can get the books mailed out. The areas in white are the remaining areas in Kansas that do not have a functioning affiliate taking new applicants from, applications from parents. So we still have some work to do to become a full statewide program that covers any any family in the state that wants it. And I have been hard at work pitching potential funders and 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 helping um, work with with support from the Dollywood Foundation to find additional local partners. The way the program works, we as the state wide partner will um, match half the cost of the program uh, with all of the local partners. The, the criteria to be a local partner is that um, we need the organization to be a 501c3 nonprofit. And um, we have currently 103 local affiliates that we are partnered with across the state. We are in 182 zip codes across the state. There's, there's still territory to go, as you can see. But since July 1, when we stepped into the full statewide level commitment to every, um, every to partner with every program in the state and not just the, the focus on new counties, um, we have grown the program by 14% since July 1st. There currently are 48,269 Kansas children enrolled. We still want to grow that number um, significantly because that we are still, we're probably at um, 25 to 28% of eligible children in Kansas enrolled in the program, and we, we strive to do better. But I will say that Kansas ranked number nine in the country for enrollment in the month of November. So we are working, our partners are helping, and um, the work to grow and enroll new kids is, is happening. We have Three areas that are on the list of committed and are awaiting approval from the U.S. Postal Service on the application to join the program as a nonprofit. You know, it has to do with the mailing rate. Um, so we are excited to to um, welcome Stevens County. Um, St. John's in Stafford County and Sedan in Chautauqua County, though they are um, within weeks, I think, of, of being approved and, and um, become a functioning local partner. We do not have any coverage in um, Nemaha County, Kiowa County, Comanche, Ness, Lane, Stanton, and Jefferson counties. So we are actively seeking partnership. Um, in my perfect world, we would we would have a partner that is willing to become a gap filler for us and just say, yes, we'll, we'll cover all the remaining areas, but that may be um, 
a bit ambitious. I have been hard at work in the Northeast because you can see a lot of blank areas. Those counties are partially covered, but we, we have a lot of work to do. Um, the advisory committee that this 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 cabinet um, authorized has been meeting and working and um, they they are a source of of um, potential funding partners so I've been been scheduling pitch meetings and working to bring folks on board so there's a lot of interest and I am anticipating that as a goal for 2023 we will get to full coverage across the state a reminder this is a voluntary program for parents to choose to enroll their children in but once enrolled um, eligible children are from birth till their fifth birthday and the the program will mail one age appropriate book per Per month to each child enrolled. The program costs $26 per year per child. Um, we, we then would pay half of that, so $13 a year per child, and the local partner covers the other half. The costs cover the printing of the books for Kansas children and the mailing costs for Kansas kids. All of the overhead otherwise is handled by the Dollywood Foundation. Um, overall for for the program so we are we're appreci very appreciative of the partnership and the support um, from the legislature getting our line item in the budget we will outgrow that line item so part of the june budget recommendations involved growth in the dollar amount allocated for this program i am hopeful that that will go through because we we have a lot of potential. This program has proven, um, Dollywood Foundation has studies to show the benefit of helping foster a love of reading early in a child's life so that when they arrive in kindergarten, um, they are equipped with, with um, a predisposition to love reading and, and um, it is a recipe for success. So we are excited about this program as you, as you might hear in my voice. Um, we have been, as, as the um, annual report outlines, um, I have had a number of conversations with organizations around the state. Um, the Kansas Chamber of Commerce has invited me in and I've had several follow-up meetings with, with their staff. They are very aware of the role child care plays in economic development and are proving to be a good partner, um, as well as local chambers of commerce and economic development organizations. So I have been, um, there's an uptick in the number of invitations to come give presentations around child care um, to help the business community understand how they can get connected. The, the, Basically what I share with them are the resources that are available. Um, primarily it's connecting them to Child Care Aware of Kansas as the resource and referral agent for the state of Kansas. And then obviously KDHE licensing folks um, and, and you know, the DCF subsidy program plays a part, but it's trying to connect the, the um, community of stakeholders that know child care is important and an issue in their area, but they, they don't know where to turn to get support. So we have, have been promoting the Communities in Action program that you had a presentation about last month or at the last meeting. And that there we've seen a, an uptick in interest. And I know that that program is providing a lot of support. And finally, I um, a couple of weeks ago attended the National Trust Fund Alliance. It's the National Alliance of Children's Trust Funds I had their annual meeting in person for the first time in three years. So it was nice to go and, and um, learn alongside colleagues from states around the country. It was a conference that was held in partnership with the Prevent Child Abuse America um, program. So we had our partners from KCSL, the Kansas Children's Services League, attended as well. And we had overlapping um, sessions with them. So it, it was a worthwhile week spent learning about preventive measures to um, help strengthen families across the country. I will stop there because this is this meeting is running um, long. I appreciate your time and attention. Um, I think um, 
the, the upcoming meeting schedule for 2023 is available to all of you. So you can help um, help us with attendance by, by putting these on your calendar. I think Lindsay is probably um, going to be sending, if she hasn't already, um, sending the meeting invitations for 2023 to make it easy to accept them and, and have them ready and available. We as a group decided on virtual meetings because of distance that some members need to travel and work schedules and the like. Um, but we are also, Kim and I are talking about a retreat at some point um, in, in the first half of 2023. The only change from the first Friday of alternate months that you'll see on that progression of meetings is the April meeting, which we, we opted not to meet on Good Friday, which is the first Friday in April. So that one, we, we shifted to April 14th, the second week. Otherwise, it is 9 a.m. on the first Friday of alternate months, beginning with February 3rd. And um, we just very much appreciate the, the time that all of you devote to attending. I know schedules are busy and it, it's not always easy, but thank you. We, we appreciate your participation. Kim, thank I'll you. turn it back to you. Thank you, Melissa. Good report. All right. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? I need a cabinet member. This is Delise, so moved. Is there a second? Monica second. Monica seconded. Uh, that one we don't need a roll call vote on. So uh, all in favor, uh, say aye. 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 All right, we are adjourned and thank you all again for your participation. You're staying with us. It's been a good meeting. We've learned a lot and we've seen a lot of progress. So thanks everybody. Have a good day. Thanks to all the staff. Doing thanks guys. Appreciate it. Bye-bye.